Hello, I'd like to welcome everybody to today's broadcast, New Ideas for Bicycle-Friendly Communities. We're excited to have you with us today. My name is Jennifer Evans Cowley and I serve as the webcast coordinator for the APA Chapters, Divisions, and Universities Planning webcast series. I have a few introductory items to go over and then we'll be turning it over to our speakers for today to go over and introduce you to today's session. First of all, the slides from today's session will be available after the session at the utah-apa.org website in the webcast uh, archive, so you can pick up the slides and the recording of today's session there after the broadcast. If you have a question during today's session, you're welcome to type that into the GoToWebinar uh, box located in your GoToWebinar toolbar. We will be taking those questions and our speakers will be responding to those at the end of the session. If you have a technical or administrative question, then I'll be responding to those as they come in. We have added some a new webcast address that started at the a little earlier this year. It's utah-apa.org backslash webcast. And this is where you can find all the latest on the webcast schedule. Our, uh, this webcast is in part the collection of our chapters and divisions that bring you the webcast series throughout the year. Our sponsor for today's webcast is the Indiana chapter, and we appreciate their participation in making this webcast possible for you. We have a number of upcoming webcasts that are available. I want to point out a couple of new ones that have been added to the schedule in the last couple of weeks. Next week we're offering the Revitalized Chesapeake Bay Restoration Program. Uh, that session is uh, sure to be exciting with great officials from EPA and other agencies that's sponsored by the Intergovernmental and Regional Planning Division, so that's a new one to look out for. Another new one is on June 24th, the introduction of the H&T Affordability Index and Applications for Planning. That's sponsored by the Technology Division. Some of you may be familiar with the Center for Neighborhood Technologies Housing and Transportation Affordability Index. That's what they're going to be talking about in that session. And another new one sponsored by the Economic Development Division is on June 17th, Planning for Regional Innovation Clusters. That one's now available for registration. So you can sign up for all of those. I do want to point out that the real estate finance session scheduled for June 10th is almost full. So if that one's of interest, I would encourage you to go ahead and register for that in the next couple of days as we will be closing registration shortly on that session because it is almost full. To log your credits for today's session, you'll be going to the planning.org slash CM website. You can click on today. It is a full day of events, so you have to click on the date to get the full list and you're going to select new ideas for bicycle friendly communities. So you can go ahead and log your credits after the conclusion of today's event. We have two wonderful speakers with us today, Pete Fritz and Shane Burkhard. I'm going to go ahead and introduce them and then turn things over to them. So Pete Fritz has his Bachelor's in Landscape Architecture and he's an AICP planner. He is a Healthy Communities Planner with the Indiana State Department of Health, Division of Nutrition and Physical Activity. He has over 25 years of extensive experience in urban planning, urban design, transportation related design, trail planning, and working with project stakeholders in planning and designing great communities with a focus on promoting healthy and active lifestyles through change in the built environment. Pete has a unique background in community planning and landscape architecture, having worked in both the public and private sectors. Pete's current projects include developing and facilitating a series of bicycle-friendly community workshops and a statewide bicycle facility and policy survey. He's also developing partnerships with the ISDH and other state agencies. Pete serves on the board of directors for Bicycle Indiana, a statewide bicycle advocacy group. He's also the Bike Commuter Chair for the Central Indiana Bicycling Association and has served as the Bicycling Representative on the Trail Advisory Board for the Indiana Department of Natural Resources. Pete also volunteers for the Indianapolis Department of Public Works Mayor's Bicycle Ad Advisory Council. Shane Burkhardt is an AICP Planner and Director of Planning and Urban Design Services with America Structure Point Incorporated. As Director, Shane oversees a wide range of urban planning, urban design, and economic development services, including comprehensive planning, land use regulations, economic and demographic analysis, strategic planning, and specialized studies. 
Shane's most recent work was a master planner of the Speed Zone Master Plan, a redevelopment of a 400-acre site just south of the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, and the City of uh, Whiting Lakefront Master Plan, a plan for the Lake Michigan shoreline to enhance public access and provide for habitat restoration. Both plans called for multimodal facilities to improve mobility for pedestrians and bicyclists. Shane also serves on the design team for the urban design and transportation projects that include specialized bicycle facilities. Uh, Shane is a 1998 graduate of the Urban Planning Program at Ball State University and holds degrees in urban planning and development and political science. Shane has been a lifelong avid cyclist, a member of the League of American Bicyclists, Association for Pedestrian and Bicycle Professionals, and grew up with both of his parents as league certified cycling instructor, uh, instructors. He knows his hand signals. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Pete and Shane. Great. Well, Hello. Well, this is Pete Fritz. I'm Shane, and we're and we're here. We're we're very happy to be here, and uh, welcome. And good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are right now in the country. And uh, we're going to jump right into this right now uh, with our first slide. Um, just a, a quick overview. We're going to we're going to start out with some some general discussion of, uh, of bicycling statistics, um, also some health issues uh, around cycling. And, um, and then talk about various bicycle facility types, um, some, some specific uh, things that are happening here in Indianapolis, and then Shane's going to talk about a, uh, a project that he's working on uh, that's very unique that integrates cycling into an urban setting. So um, to get things going, I want to talk a little bit about some bicycling statistics. I think the, the timing of this session is is, uh, is good that this is Bike to Work Week that many of you may be um, involved in in your communities. Uh, I know the, the weather is typically getting better around the, the country and people are getting out on bikes. Um, and what we've seen is, is quite a bit of change in, in bicycling in the last few years. Um, cycling community is a diverse group, just like any demographic group. Um, there are a wide range of, of cyclists with differing abilities, differ so, differing social economic um, characteristics and adult cyclists typically though have a mean income of sixty thousand dollars and I think uh, many many people don't understand that typically the um, the the cycling community uh, typically has money to spend um, and um, and this is important to think about as you're planning for uh, for bikes in your community and it's also a good reason to do it um, there are more bicyclists in the US and skiers golfers and tennis players combined it's a big market um, if bicycling is uh, supported by a, a large bicycle manufacturing industry as well as a sales industry, and you can take advantage of the sales uh, bike, bike shops in your community. Many of them now are embracing advocacy and promoting bicycling um, and are volunteering their time in their communities and their money um, to promote bicycling uh, as, a, as just a good thing to do in communities. Um, a couple examples, um, and these in Indianapolis and, and Columbus here in the Midwest have seen drastic increases in bike commuters, and you can easily measure this if you get on census data and start to see this, that uh, Columbus saw over 150 percent increase in, in bike commuting um, in the last few years. Indianapolis saw over half increase in bike commuting. And, um, and again, this shows that when these communities make an asserted effort to provide facilities for bikes, um, bike, bicycling increases, and it's, it's something that is a that you can easily measure in your communities, and it's, I think it's something to, to be, um, be aware of. So, um, and the next slide shows um, some bicycling statistics um, that you can, you can get access to. The, the League of American uh, Bicyclists has, has, these, um, has these statistics and charts that they track for their communities that are certified as bicycle-friendly communities. So this is another source that, uh, that planners can get a hold of to start to prove and show how communities that are really working at this um, purposefully can see uh, great increases in the percentage of bike use in their community. So um, there's a definite relationship to investment in bike facilities and people using those um, that you can, you can start, to, uh, start to use in, in promoting bicycling in your community. So what are some of the types of bicyclists when we think of, of uh, of promoting bike-friendly communities. Uh, like I said, bike, bicycling is a range of, of bicycle types. Um, and there are, um, 
there are different types of, of, of cyclists. Certainly kids riding on sidewalks are one group, but also occasional casual cyclists riding on streets, trails, and bike lanes um, are another. And when you think about how to target um, certain groups in your community for promoting bikes or, or building bike facilities, this casual cyclist who sometimes goes out and rides but would ride more if they had safer and better facilities is really your target audience for most of your projects and your planning. If you, if you design it and plan it for them, you will really be, be meeting the needs of, of all cyclists, both advanced cyclists and even those um, that are um, maybe less skilled or just starting to bicycle. Um, certainly, though, per experienced cyclists prefer to be on the streets. Many of them are on the roads. Even if you build, um, even if you build uh, bike paths, and uh, many of them will be in the road and mixing it up with cars, and that's something to, to remember. Plus, also, people who don't drive and maybe who can't drive, either by choice or because they don't own cars, is another a type of cyclist. The teens, people who don't have driver's license, and uh, many people who are lower income don't have a choice, and the bicycle is their form of transportation. That's how they get around. And uh, those, those types of cyclists are all over our communities as well. That's important to understand as we go forward with this discussion. So I want to talk a little bit about um, how bicycling promotes healthy communities. And this is, a, this is an emerging trend in, in communities all over America, um, is the obesity epidemic and how can we get people out and moving. Cycling is certainly a way that we can do that. And um, bicycling keeps people healthy. Um, it promotes active living. It's a way that, that people can get on their, on their bikes and run errands. Um, it's bicycling is much more than just recreation. It, it's, it, it can be transportation if you have, make the facilities for that available. And it's inexpensive. Uh, certainly a bike is 30 times less expensive to buy and maintain than a car. That's, that's kind of a no-brainer. Um, but it, it really is true. And even in, in now in these past economic times, cycling is becoming um, much more desirable for people that just want to save money um, as well as have a healthy lifestyle. So. Um, Many of you might have seen these, um, these uh, Centers for Disease Control maps. I just have four of them here. But um, it's a way to really show that obesity is a, is a skyrocketing issue in the US. You know, We can certainly see how it, adva it has advanced since just the mid-'80s and has become a real um, ep epidemic in the United States, so much so that, that whole funding sources and staffs at, at departments of health are really focusing on this issue. And um, it's something that uh, really needs to be dealt with, and cycling is one way we can do that. So what are some of the health benefits of, of physical acti activity and, and cycling? There is certainly strong evidence that proves that, that cycling would reduce your risk of early death, certainly coronary heart disease and stroke, getting out and moving, deals with high blood pressure, um, um, type 2 diabetes, certainly cancers, depression. I know uh, when, I, when I commute to work, um, I am certainly in much better way to start my work day than if I were to, to drive my car. Um, it just makes me feel good. And I think that, that there's a definite correlation with that. Um, cognitive decline and, um, and falling in older adults, all these things, getting out and moving uh, and cycling can, can, can play a piece of that in providing these, these health benefits. So the um, one, one thing I think is important to understand is that there are certainly um, guidelines that the federal government puts out that, that bicycling can help meet. These physical activity guidelines um, are put out by the Department of Health and Human Services. We've had these out now since about 2008. Um, the idea is that we, we need to at least get out for 150 minutes a week of moderate intensity activity or 75 minutes of, of highly aerobic activity. And the interesting thing about this is this doesn't have to be all at one time. It can be spread out over a week into 30 day or 30 minute periods. Even during that day, it can be three 10-minute periods. Um, so the idea is, is that getting on your bike and running to the grocery store or even um, you know, just running, drive, riding around your neighborhood starts to meet this, this, um, this need. Um, so how does bicycling, bicycling improve health status? Certainly, you can uh, provide daily travel and recreation. It can meet those guidelines. It can be integrated into our daily lifestyle. Um, if, if those facilities are available to, uh, to, to facilitate that and that people feel comfortable out on their bike. And we'll be talking about that um, later. 
and obviously more people biking can help control uh, health care costs and reduce obesity and chronic disease. This is a huge issue in workplace wellness where we're finding the trend that that businesses and industries are seeing that getting people healthy and even getting people out on bikes, it helps their bottom line and there's proof to this and more and more communities are even getting into uh, promoting bike commuting as a way to create to improve the health of their employees. Um, so a couple things uh, here just some statistics. In, in Indiana the, the obesity attributable health care spending is, is, is very high. It's even, this was in 2008, it's even higher now. Um, it's over $500 per adult um, across the entire state. And just, uh, just three hours a week can reduce a person's risk of heart disease by 50%. Um, and it's amazing that, that just, just putting some of this activity on bikes as part of that can really have an impact. And, and finally, this is an interesting little chart that, um, that John Cooker, who's a, he's, he's a, um, a bicycle advocate, he lectures on bicycling from Rutgers University, put this together. And it shows uh, USA is on the far left. The green dots are, um, are percent of, of active transit, um, which is biking and walking. The red line is obesity. So you see US has a low rate of active transit a high obesity rate, that's even higher now than 25%. Um, but you see as you go through some of these international communities, the higher the rate of active transportation, the less the rate of obesity. And there's a, there's a direct correlation to this. Um, and this is a great chart if you can use this in, in your efforts to really show uh, and prove that there is a direct correlation to getting people moving in transportation, active transit, and the impact on their health. So with that, um, maybe some thoughts about the Netherlands. All of us have heard about what the Netherlands has, have done with cycling. At one point, they were like us. Um, after World War II, they were, they were a car-dominated culture. But they embraced this idea of cycling, and you see where they are now. Certainly, these images show people out riding. Um, many of them don't wear helmets, which is a whole other issue, but it's a very safe environment. It's, it's, a, it's a whole different culture in that respect. People have their kids on bikes. I think this is a prime minister who, who regularly rides to his office as an example for the rest of the country. Um, and some of these images show people um, using uh, pedicabs, um, riding in work clothes to work, carrying musical instruments, their pets. You know, it's just part of their life. And, and in many um, U.S. communities are starting to discover this, and you start to see hints of this. And I think that's a good sign that um, this, this country has taken this route and has made major changes in their culture around uh, cycling. Uh, you know, Pete, I had the uh, opportunity to, to live in the Netherlands six months uh, or so while I was studying. And I mean, I'll tell you right away, just for anecdotally, I dropped 20 pounds uh, in almost a month uh, in living over there. And it, and it was the same with all the other uh, folks that came over from both the United States and, and Canada. Uh, just because the lifestyle is so different and you don't realize how much physical activity you're getting in just in your daily commutes. Uh, uh, a lot of walking and bicycling that you don't even notice as part of your lifestyle and just moving around. Uh, everything is so convenient over there. Uh, but, I mean, it, it's definitely a healthier culture. And uh, their health care costs are a lot lower than the United States because of that. Right. And as I said, the interesting message is that, that this didn't just happen by itself. Um, it, was a, it was a government mandate that they went through, and it took them a long time. And they've just started a lot earlier than we have. And there's no reason to think that we can't get there. And I think that's an important part of this message, too, is that, um, that it is attainable. And it's just uh, something that we, the communities, have to do in a very proactive manner. So what are some of the trends in the United States? Now, we're going to go through some, some of these ideas about uh, bike lane innovations. Um, uh, how uh, some some signals and um, traffic management issues with bikes? Um, how about bike commuters? How can you commute to work and use bicyclist transportation? Um, and then end up with a talk about cycle tracks, which is a very specific type of bike facility in, in an urban setting. Um, so first of all, to set the kind of framework, there are many standards for cycling. These national standards and guidelines that uh, planners and engineers and public officials use. Even bike advocates can use these to a large extent. Um, uh, the the ASTO standard is is 
we want to talk about those. There are, there are a couple of these. One is the um, is the Green Book, the Geometric Design of, for Highways and Streets. Um, this is an interesting standard that the if you don't know what ASTO is, it's the American Association of State Highway Transportation Officials, and um, and this came out in early 2000. It's uh, the idea here is, is this is the green book that engineers use to, to figure out the geometric layout of roadways, and bicycles are part of that. Um, the, one of the important pieces to take from this is many times you can reduce roadway, uh, road lane widths to accommodate cyclists. Many roads are over-designed in their, in their lane widths, and in the correct settings, uh, you can reduce those and find room or lost space that you can put bikes, bikes in. The next one is another... Um, ASTO standard. Uh, basically, you know, obviously, those of you that that are engineers or work with engineers know that the ASTO Green Book is is very much the the bible when it comes to a lot of transportation planning and the design of road facilities. And uh, in uh, the mid to late '90s, ASTO finally came out with a set of standards for bicycle facilities. And and uh, the Green Book for bicycles, uh, developed in '99. Uh, it is still in place for setting a lot of the standards for, uh, for federal funding projects uh, when it comes to designing bicycle facilities. But, uh, but these, these guidelines have, have really started to stagnate as communities have developed innovations uh, well and above uh, you know, what we were talking about in the 80s and 90s that were embodied in this manual. Uh, AASHTO has started to update this process, but it has uh, stalled a, a number of times. Uh, in, in the meantime, one of the other Bibles in terms of uh, traffic signal devices, which is also extremely important when you're planning bicycle facilities, uh, is the Manual Uniform uh, Traffic Control uh, Devices ma uh, Manual, uh, the MUTCD. And uh, this uh, basically was just updated in 2010. Uh, a lot of the states are currently in the process of adopting uh, the new version. Uh, they're supposed to have that complete by the end of this year. Uh, but the new version actually does uh, embody uh, more in terms of some of the bicycle facility signage uh, and lane markings uh, that are starting to become more standardized across the U.S. And Pete and I will talk a little more about those uh, as they apply throughout the presentation. Now, in the in the absence of, of really AASHTO being able to update their standards, there's been a number of states that have adopted up, uh, uh, updated guidelines uh, for their state departments of transportation. Uh, that includes a, a draft manual here in Indiana. Uh, Wisconsin has an absolutely uh, exemplarily a uh, uh, type of uh, uh, manual that, that I actually use as, as a set of guidelines uh, here. Uh, but NACTO, which is the uh, uh, National Association of uh, City Transportation Officials, uh, has recently come out with a new uh, manual that is just uh, absolutely amazing in terms of uh, detailed guidelines as well as illustrations. And uh, I would urge you, if you've uh, not gone to uh, the website nacto.org, that you take a, a look at that. Uh, this is a free publication to be able to download. And uh, uh, it has a lot of great information on a lot of the new facilities that are out there that communities are starting to uh, implement. OK, yeah, that, the NACTO guide is really uh, user friendly, too. It's, it's, uh, it's useful for engineers, but it's also use for, useful for lay people and bike advocates. It has a lot of great computer graphics. It's filled with photographs that you can use. And uh, it's very user friendly. It has both electronic version and a PDF version now available. So now we want to talk about what, what are some current approaches to a bike network in terms of bike planning. Um, certainly, uh, bike route systems, uh, bike lanes, and rail trails and greenways are the traditional ways that, that communities have been uh, approaching bike networks. And we want to talk about those um, those a little bit. I think the the idea of uh, uh, bike route systems, um, many times communities, that's their first things they do, and, that, and that's very useful. Um, they identify bike routes and they sign them with, with signage, um, and many times those bike routes may or may not have uh, markings on them. And it's important to understand many roads right now may be appropriate for cycling, and that's, and that's a great start, identifying those roads that are typically low volume, have plenty of pavement width, um, and uh, 
and are suitable for cycling, and those can become a bike route system or your initial kind of planning effort maybe. Then it seems like, um, and rails to trails also play a role as kind of a backbone of your network system. Many communities have rail trail networks now, and if your community doesn't have one, sometimes it's seen as, well, why don't you? It's, it's such a, uh, a ubiquitous thing, and, and people take them for granted sometimes. But the thing is, with rail trails and greenways, they don't go where everyone wants to go. Um, certainly, they're great as a, as a backbone or as your primary kind of bike thoroughfare, but cyclists want to go other places too, and that's where bike lanes come into play. So uh, many times then uh, bike lanes become the next step in communities is figuring out, well, how do you get from your home on a bike to the trailhead rather than putting your bike on the back of your car and driving to a trailhead to ride on a trail? Wouldn't it be great if we can just ride our bike to that trail? Um, and either recreate or use that trail to maybe go to my next bike lane and go to my destination, wherever that may be. So I think that's where, um, that's where many communities are now, is the next stage of, of development to figure out what is that network and grid of bike lanes and systems to get around town. Well, we're really going to focus a lot of today on the innovative on-street uh, uh, facilities and some of the, the demand management side uh, that goes along with that. Because uh, as, as Pete talked about, trails and greenways, you know, if your community has not developed these yet, you're, you're probably behind the eight ball. Uh, but these are great systems, and we're not going to get it much into cost, but these are systems that are extremely pre expensive per lane mile uh, to develop. And uh, when Pete talked earlier about targeting the, the recreation and the casual riders, uh, a lot of times improving your uh, roads for cycling, whether it's creating uh, safe shared uh, use facilities on the roadway uh, or bicycle lanes, uh, actually helps move some of those casual and recreation riders onto your on-street facilities. Uh, that can be constructed as linkages throughout your community at a fraction of the cost uh, of trails. And so you really want to think about how all these systems can come together as a part of a larger network and uh, do a bike plan that really looks to spend, uh, get the best bang for your buck in terms of expanding your bicycle facilities. Right. And, when, and just, just real quickly, one, one interesting thing that's emerged is, is, um, is, is bicyclists are kind of indicators of, of bike friendliness, and especially women on bikes are the biggest indicator of how your community is doing. There's some research that's available now that shows if you can get women to ride bikes and um, get an increase of women riding, that really shows that your community is increasing. And there's been a lot of in increasing in getting people on bikes. Um, and that's a lot of research that's been done on that because women are typically risk adverse in terms of cycling. Um, and, uh, and that's another good target audience is, is making your bike facilities um, uh, comfortable for all users um, and including women. So next, uh, innovative bike lanes. We're going to talk about a number of these including uh, bike boxes, um, colored lanes, floating lanes, buffered lanes, and uh, contraflow lanes which are bike lanes that go against traffic which is a little counterintuitive um, but there, there are places for all of these things. We like to upset the engineers with that last Yeah, and that's, yeah, that will raise a few <laughs> eyebrows um, in your communities. But there are, there are places where they are appropriate, and it's been proven that these, that these things really work. Um, so colored bike lanes are something that uh, have been used in Europe in a long time and starting in, in, in many communities, but a lot of communities it's a new idea on how to use paint um, within bike lanes to, um, to help uh, alert motorists of, of cyclists and also show cyclists uh, where to go. In a lot of cases here in the United States, the, the, the colored lane markings are used especially where you would want your facility to pop, uh, if it's a more congested intersection, uh, if you have a lot of information that a driver is trying to uh, uh, process at one time, but you need to make sure that the bike lane is one of those priority items for them to process, uh, adding some color to the bike lane can, can really help. This can also help in uh, pedestrian congested areas because it also makes the pedestrian more aware of the bike lane uh, so you can reduce uh, pedestrian bicycle conflicts which are also are a leading cause of uh, injury 
uh, for both the pedestrian and the bicyclist. Uh, you can see here uh, communities throughout the United States have experimented with uh, various different colors uh, to varying degrees of uh, success from uh, cranberry to, to blue uh, to green uh, to mauve. Uh, you name it. Uh, it's, uh, but uh, basically, uh, as of late, Federal Highways has determined that green is the new black. Uh, so this season, uh, uh, green is uh, really what we're going to be seeing in terms of bicycles. They've uh, made an advisory ruling now that you will no longer have to seek uh, experimental status for federal funds that would be using for colored bike lanes uh, as long as you'd be using the green. And most of the major cities, including New York City, uh, Indianapolis has just selected as well, have moved to the green standard. Uh, the reason the other ones aren't used is because they've been either selected for uh, purple, for example, is now for HOV and toll lanes. Uh, the blue uh, uh, they're concerned about the conflict with uh, accessibility, uh, so basically that's that's why they selected the, uh, the the green standard. And you see those a lot where you have lane shifts, where bike lanes shift at intersections, um, where you might even have just a piece of it painted to show the driver and the cyclist that the bike lane is shifting to a through lane, say at an intersection. Bike boxes are another uh, another interesting thing that that incorporates uh, painted pavement as well as um, trying to get cyclists up to the stop bar and intersection actually in front of vehicles. It's kind of a, it, there are, many communities are starting to do this in the United States, but it's still not a common thing that you see very often here. It, it, one, one advantage is it increases, it increases visibility of cyclists and it eliminates right-hand cutoff. Many, um, many accidents are from turning movements of cars as they make right turns into cyclists that are going through intersections. And that's a primary way that, that cyclists get hurt. So this is one way to get cyclists in front of cars um, and let them go through the intersection first. It's combined many times with a short cycle uh, phase of, of your signal phasing. And again, it, it does, although it does eliminate the right turn on red option because if, the, if there are bikes up there, you know, certainly cars can't go through and make a right turn on red. Uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts was one of the first communities to start integrating these. Uh, they, they've uh, done that with, uh, with a lot of success. Uh, we're starting to integrate those here in Indianapolis uh, as well. Uh, you can see, though, that it does create a situation where the, the stop bar for traffic is uh, further behind the light. Uh, than a lot of engineers are typically comfortable with, uh, but you have to remember that the bicyclist would basically count as your first car going through that light. So it still does allow for that intersection to be clear uh, for the oncoming traffic. Mm -hmm. Next is, um, is raised and contraflow lanes. The raised lanes, um, this example here is shown at an intersection, to, uh, also has a traffic calming effect. And contraflow lanes, many times are used in urban settings where you have a series of one-way um, networks. And as cyclists, especially commuting cyclists in urban areas, we want to get places at the same um, convenience as vehicles. But many times um, that is, uh, you, can, you can make it even more convenient for cyclists by providing um, access through these one-way networks because it's difficult in one-way networks to get to where you want to go as a cyclist. Many times you have to go out of your way a couple blocks and on a bike, that takes a lot longer than a car. Um, so contraflow lanes make it easier for cyclists to get through these kind of one-way networks. Uh, in, in a lot of cases, though, uh, obviously state laws and, and city ordinances uh, would need to be adjusted for some of these to be able to be uh, legal. Uh, but you have to look at how uh, pedestrians and bicyclists, for that matter, uh, interact in terms of finding the shortest route for spaces. And uh, Pete's exactly right. Uh, because of the amount of energy expended uh, to go out of your way further, which can add 10, 15 minutes to your journey in some cases, uh, this can sometimes uh, provide a better option. Oftentimes these are installed, for example, on the right uh, is in uh, Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, these are installed typically on uh, low uh, capacity streets uh, with, uh, with low speeds. And often after studying bicycle traffic and seeing a lot of illegal contraflow traffic, uh, they will go ahead and, uh, and install these uh, to basically already uh, uh, adapt to how the traffic is moving along the street anyway. 
the, the race lane on the, on the left uh, really goes along with a lot of uh, traffic calming today. Uh, just like uh, you would have a raised crosswalk, uh, this works in the same manner uh, by reducing vehicle speeds by uh, 10 to 15 uh, percent and uh, slowing, that, uh, slowing that approach, uh, very similar to a speed table. Okay, the next is, is shared lanes with transit. And um, many times along, along transit corridors, you have extra right-of-way where you can get a bike path. Many times there might already be a bike path there on a rail trail corridor, and then that corridor opens up for transit use, which is going to be the case um, here in Indianapolis in the future. Um, but, but bikes and transit can coexist. Many times it has to do with the speed of that transit. The, the, the Minneapolis version on the left is um, kind of a, a light commuter transit. Um, and if you look at that, the only, the only barrier between those two is a three-strand wire fence. Um, it's, it's really not a big issue, and this is a very heavily commuted corridor um, right going into downtown, and, uh, and it's, it, it really works very well. And obviously the, the Switzerland example is um, these on-street um, uh, transit cars are mixing it up with pedestrians and cyclists, and it's very compatible. So it's something to look at as you're doing your transit planning to make sure that bikes uh, can coexist with transit. Um, buffered lanes are another issue, and these are where you get maybe uh, bike lanes put in on a higher volume roadway and maybe a little higher speed. Um, the idea is, is, is to provide a little extra space um, between the, uh, the, the bike lane and the cars to, to help really bring that level of service or that comfort level up so you can attract casual cyclists. And many times with that little bit of buffer, um, you might get someone who would feel comfortable on that, that if you didn't have the bu buffer, they wouldn't go out there and use it. Um, so there are certain times where the buffered bike lane would work. Not all cases, but again, if it increases the comfort level and the amount of the number of people that will use that facility and you have enough room, um, that certainly is a good example. Yeah, both of these pictures are from New York City, and uh, this is uh, Broadway. Uh, in, in both of these pictures, uh, they, this was their first attempt at installing a, a buffered bike lane just due to the uh, uh, sheer amount of volume uh, that, that Broadway uh, carries uh, through Manhattan. And uh, it, it's been met with uh, great success and uh, New York City's bike network has really expanded and, and made a, a very significant modal shift uh, for bicyclists within the city. You can see also that they're augmenting some of those buffered areas with uh, reflective uh, barriers uh, as well for some added protection. The next is talking about floating lanes, and this is kind of interesting where you have a, a corridor, maybe a major uh, uh, commuting corridor that has, um, has parking on the street during certain times, but during commuting times, parking is not allowed on the street. And in that case, you can find um, an opportunity to put a bike lane in there when parking is not allowed and have a bike lane next to the curb, a typical bike lane situation, and then when parking is allowed, that bike lane actually floats out, outside the parking realm and right next to the parking. And there's some interesting kind of technology, thing, the technical things where you have to get your dimensions right, you have to get your, your striping right, but these floating lanes are a way to really accommodate both uh, on-street parking and cyclists on key commuter routes coming into your community. These, these really work best in shared parking situations, such as residential collector streets, uh, when you're not going to have a lot of parking during commuter hours. Uh, the same with a lot of entertainment districts, where your parking demand is going to be after commuter hours. Uh, so you uh, really allow the shared use of the bicycles during the commuting hours and the parking during the non-commuting hours. This is the Embarcadero uh, in San Francisco, uh, where that takes place, and you can see uh, the, the lane striping here to where during the non-commuting hours uh, you see the uh, bicyclists uh, going to be outside the parking. Uh, during commuting hours they will not allow the parking in this area and uh, the bicyclists would actually be in, uh, in the lane next to the curb and you would have an additional through lane of traffic. Hello? Okay. Uh, Hi. Yep. Are you in the parking lot? Or down? Okay, yeah, this is, uh, we're now going to talk a little bit about retrofitting bike lanes. Um, many, many of your communities, one of your biggest ways you can make gains is to retrofit. Obviously, um, uh, roads are already built out and you, you want to get bike lanes on those roads. 
So retrofitting is really a, a good way to do it, and it's kind of low-hanging fruit in a lot of a lot of times. Certainly, those bike lanes are can can be put in during capital um, improvements during resurfacing. If you're going to be going in there milling and resurfacing and restriping anyway, you can retrofit and get those in there. You're doing a storm sanitary storm sewer work that may be along your curb line. That's another way to get these put in, um, and. It's, uh, it, it's a really good way to find lost space, as we talked about, and especially if you can restripe, um, look at your lane widths, and be able to get a bike lane in, and, uh, and just spend some, some money on paint uh, and get that done. Uh, certainly some design, you, you need to invest in design as well to make sure that, uh, that it meets all the AASHTO standards. Um, the part of this is finding and identifying current routes uh, that bicyclists use to, to to, uh, to prioritize those as retrofit, uh, as low-hanging fruit. And um, again, making sure that you field check their cross-sections. Find out what the existing lane widths are, where are your transit connections to make sure you don't have conflicts there. Look at your traffic counts. Um, look at the types of traffic, how much, how much uh, say, truck traffic and even delivery traffic you might have. I know sometimes you retrofit in areas, um, and you may have delivery trucks wanting to park in those bike lanes, that's going to be an enforcement issue. And it's good to know that ahead of time so you can work with these delivery agencies to make sure that, uh, that they know that they're going to have to change the way they do business. Um, all of these things uh, come into uh, to play on these retrofit, but they can be some of your best and earliest uh, bike facility construction efforts. Um, Another kind of issue is to identify um, hurdles in pavement. Uh, certainly the pavement condition, lane width, drainage, railroad crossing, medians, all of these things you're going to have to look at as well, but they're certainly easy to deal with once you know what they are. And, um, and work with your design engineer um, during design, or best would be pre-construction for your striping layout change. So they know that they're going to be, um, be striping for bikes as part of the design criteria and that, um, that those pavement markings and signage are all going to be part of that design effort. So here's an example of retrofitting bike lanes. Um, this was in, in Indianapolis, uh, one of our major thoroughfares that goes through downtown and into uh, our downtown campus um, for uh, Indiana University, Purdue University. Um, before, it was a, basically a, um, a two-lane cross-section with, with parking, and we were able to to, um, to get a bike lane in there and just restripe, and I don't even think that was a repaving effort. It was more of a restriping effort at that point. And uh, we were able, there was enough room to be able to restripe and make it work. But during the, uh, during the initial uh, uh, studies on this, they actually used regular paint uh, to do the restriping. Uh, as they went back uh, through uh, and preparing for the uh, hopeful Super Bowl that, that Indianapolis may may host, uh, assuming the NFL ends their lockout, hint, hint. Uh, uh, it basically, uh, they're going to be regrading, a lot, uh, uh, milling and uh, regrading a lot of these roadways. Uh, so they're coming back uh, as they do that and using a thermoplastic inlay uh, that actually stands up and, and over the long term is uh, much cheaper in terms of maintenance and has uh, better visibility. Uh, but you can see here that uh, the lane sizes were rather excessive. So this was an, a good example of a road diet. Uh, to where you aren't reducing the volume of the street, but you actually are slowing traffic, uh, traffic calming by reducing the sizes of the lanes and still being able to add in uh, the three-foot bike path. Right, and that was a one-way facility, so there was room to, uh, this, this bike lane is only on the right-hand side on that one. Um, this is an interesting example from England. It's, it's, they call it an advisory lane on a rural road. This was between two villages that had a lot of bike traffic going back and forth on this rural road, and before you could see there were relatively narrow, kind of inconsistent shoulders um, is a two-way facility. And what they did is they went ahead and striped um, dashed bike lanes and kept a, a, a single wide travel lane. And you kind of, while well, if there's no cyclists in that bike lane, you can go, you can be in that bike lane to the edge of the road striping and two cars can pass. But if there are cyclists, you're, you have a decision to make and you have to slow down and avoid that cyclist, and the oncoming traffic does as well. It's kind of a, you know, this this would be difficult to make to happen right now in the United States, um, but it is an interesting example how they were very creative 
in, in how to bring bicyclists and cars within uh, this, this very kind of important roadway for them. So. Uh, shared roadways uh, with, with bikes are a very popular way to, to use, to get, get bikes um, identified on a roadway in, in a setting that is typically low speed and low volume for cars. Um, and they're called Sharos. And many of you probably have these, seen these in your communities. It's basically a Chevron with a bike uh, marking and with some, with some paving, or, I mean with some signing. And the idea is, is to, to make it aware to the motorists primarily that bikes are going to be here. Um, many times in these urban areas, um, even if you just did signing with a bike route, it's not going to be that apparent for, for motorists that bikes are going to be here. Pavement markings are really the most effective way to show motorists there are bikes in the area. And it also um, shows cyclists how to align and ride in these areas, especially on the lower left hand where you have on-street parking. You'll see where the Shero is actually aligned to, to, give a, 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 to, to show the cyclists that they can take the lane. If they, ride, if they ride right down the middle of that chevron, you know, they're going to be in the lane of traffic. It also shows them that they're outside of the door zone for that car that's going to be opening a door. So it gives, you can actually help channelize bike traffic with these sharrows also. The uh, city of Denver was actually one of the first cities to, to use the sharrow, and they actually use it in their urban area. And they, they work really well for urban arterial corridors to where they are higher volumes but very low speed traffic. And uh, it really does do a better job than just share the road signage itself in terms of alerting the driver uh, to how important uh, it is that bicycles are sharing that area. Another added benefit, especially in the urban areas, uh, especially when you have the urban uh, riders that uh, may have to use bicycles as their primary mode of transportation, uh, often those are your wrong way riders. And uh, a, uh, education and outreach programs uh, can go so far, and I think most communities need to do a better job. We'll kind of talk a little more about that later. Uh, but at the same time, uh, these pavement markings also indicate to the bicycle uh, which side of the road and uh, which direction they should be riding. Um, they're also used on uh, another form of kind of shared roadway are these bicycle boulevards. This was a term that was kind of coined in Berkeley. and. Um, in, in California about in, in campus settings to show that these are, these are roadways that are expected to be shared between automobiles and bicycles. And uh, there's a lot of different uh, methods to, to make these roads accommodate both vehicles and cyclists. And the, uh, the graphic on the right shows a plan of, of many of the typical kind of tools they use. Many times it's pavement markings, many times it's um, it's uh, traffic diverters at intersections to allow bicyclists through, but to divert traffic. Um, this one, the image on the lower left shows that the right turn only for for cars, but cyclists can go straight through, and um, and that's very important to allow those connections for bikes, but it's slowing traffic uh, and managing traffic for vehicles in these neighborhoods, um, and other other campuses. I know um, in Indiana University is looking at. at incorporating some bicycle boulevards and sharrows and maybe some, some of these ideas um, in and around their campus. It's a very effective way to uh, channelize bikes and cars and make it safe for everyone. Uh, I forgot to mention uh, one other item with the uh, sharrow is the uh, 2010 MUTCD does adopt the sharrow as an official street marking pattern. Uh, so you no longer have to uh, seek experimental approval uh, for, for its use as some of your states adopted the new MUTCD. Uh, it includes the, uh, uh, the, uh, the on-the-ground uh, pavement marking as well as the may use full lane uh, sign that would be used uh, in conjunction with the pavement marking. Okay. Um, Next, we're going to talk a little bit about bike signals and, um, and cycle tracks. And bike signals are something that's been used in Europe for some time. And starting to see a need for this, as you start getting higher volumes of cyclists, many times you, there's a need to, to get cyclists through intersections with their own signals and their own timing phases. And it's really a function of, of the volume of bikes that you have at intersections to make it safer um, for cars. Um, and here's a couple of examples that show, you know, typical separate signals for bikes or integrated signals on the signal poles um, uh, for vehicles. And they're, they're now are starting to, in, in the United States, uh, starting to emerge 
um, standards for this. Yeah. Uh, on, the, on the left, uh, this is a, a fully separated phasing uh, for bicycles. Uh, this is in uh, Groningen, Netherlands. Uh, so you can see that they're dismounted and, and waiting for uh, the, the green signal. Uh, on the right, uh, this is on uh, Jane Jacobs Way in, uh, in New York City. And uh, this is uh, a, not a separate phase signal, but similar to what they're doing for transit. Uh, this is kind of a, a uh, jump ahead where they have a, uh, a protected green that allows the bicyclist to get out ahead uh, of the remainder of the traffic. Okay, next we're going to talk about cycle tracks. Um, cycle track is kind of a, a new term um, that, that if you haven't, don't have one of these in your community or haven't worked with them, you may not be aware of it. But it is a, it is a, um, it's a facility that basically identifies um, a, a, an area for cyclists um, that, is, that is very well defined. Many times it's either on, on top the curb or below the curb or separated from a raised curb from traffic. Um, and it's, it's, this has been used for a long time in Canada, uh, in Europe, and in the Netherlands. And we're starting to see these starting, these are emerging in the United States as a way where you create, again, a facility that is very comfortable for casual cyclists. Um, when you're in these facilities on these cycle tracks, you're typically separated from traffic in one form or another. And, and you feel it's, it's very comfortable. You have um, uh, at intersections, uh, the, the crossings are very well marked. Um, you have typical, typical signals that go along, um, maybe with some of the bike signals that we, we have shown, and uh, they're very well signed. So again, if you want to um, get casual cyclists in, in also in specifically an urban setting, um, cycle tracks are a good way to go. It, it should be noted that there are some issues with cycle tracks, though, because of the fact that a lot of our recreational casual sci uh, uh, cyclists uh, have kind of grown up exposed to the rail trail uh, and the greenways, which are completely uh, segregated facilities. Uh, a, a lot of communities have uh, gravitated more towards cycle tracks or, or also known as side paths uh, in their community to follow roadways. And there's some drawbacks uh, to these types of facilities. One is going to be cost. Uh, number two is uh, depending upon uh, the number of uh, streets, that would cut across uh, the side path, you can actually see an increase uh, in the number of accidents. And so sometimes side paths may be a great opportunity, especially for higher speed roadways uh, where you don't have a lot of uh, cross cuts, uh, cro uh, intersecting streets, as well as uh, uh, in, in other areas uh, such as uh, rural highways. But they may be drawbacks uh, to where bicycle lanes may be safer uh, for recreational uh, cyclists in, in other areas, especially where you have uh, on-street parking and a lot of other issues. Uh, so, and we'll kind of talk about making some of those decisions. Yeah, and it's important to know, um, for bike commuters especially, sometimes they may want, even though you have a, a cycle track in an urban area or a side path, that they may want to ride in the street regardless, especially if there's a lot of um, pedestrians or or slower riders, and they're on a mission to get to work or to go to their destination, they might want to mix it up with cars. And, um, and, and I think it's important to allow cyclists choice. And if you do have a side path or a cycle track, don't make it an ordinance that people cannot still ride in the street if they choose to. And I, I think that's important uh, for the cycling community. Now, commuting facilities, um, these are starting to pop up all over the country as there's an increasing need um, and demand for people who commute to work or to, to downtown or suburban locations to have places where they can park their bike securely, even outside the weather, that they can have a place to take a shower, they can have a place to even have their bike fixed if they have a problem, and, um, and it's really a, a way to promote way, people for using their bike for transportation. Um, certainly bike stations or bike commuter hubs are, um, are a way to do that. And, uh, and they also, many of these provide bike sharing programs where you can rent a bike, kind of your traditional bike rental, or you can even um, share a bike uh, and, and, and check it out for a certain amount of time, bring it back. There's lots of uh, interesting things happening around bike commuter facilities. Um, one of these is, um, I want to talk about also then is bike parking. How, how do we then deal with, with all these bikes? We get all these people on bikes in our communities, where are they going to park? Certainly that's a big issue. This, this, uh, 
this bike on the left, I don't know if that's really a, a true commuter that carries that many locks with him. I think it's more of a political statement. Um, but certainly the one on the right, this is a true, you can really see a true need for all this parking. Um, and we can only hope that someday we might have that need. Uh, certainly um, interesting kind of examples in, in Taiwan and Tokyo, this idea of looking at underground bike parking. People are really starting to think about this and how do you get uh, get all these bikes organized and parked so so more people can can ride bikes these these uh, these two level bike racks on the left are very effective and many people are starting to use these in in uh, in enclosed spaces as part of bike commuter facilities um, and uh, and many cities are doing this already Minneapolis has one the one on the left is um, is is a facility uh, in, in Minneapolis that is very, it's very well used. There's a bike shop in there. There is a coffee shop. Um, they have showers and it's very heavily used on, on right off one of their major greenways that then from there you can go in and walk right downtown or wherever you need to go. It's right next to a major medical facility or a hospital. Um, certainly on the west coast, uh, all over the country, these, these bike community commuter facilities are, are starting to uh, pop up and here in Indianapolis, we're just getting ready to open the door for um, a, a facility that's over 2,500 square feet. It's a shared facility being shared with a local YMCA, so it'll also have um, have fitness uh, classes and accept and, and areas. So it's, it's an, sometimes uh, finding partnerships with uh, with other organizations like YMCAs. Uh, you have shared kind of interests, and uh, you can also do a shared management. Where in this in Indianapolis, the Y is going to manage part of it. Um, they're going to contract out the bike shop to another group, and uh, we're really able to make that work right downtown. And it's an interesting kind of private uh, public partnership. As you're planning for cyclists, even if you're not a cyclist uh, yourself, it's it's really important that you understand the needs of the various different user groups when you're looking at any kind of transportation demand management strategy. Uh, such as uh, bike parking or, in this case, you know, the bicycle commuter facilities. Uh, unless you have uh, 55 to 60 degree weather uh, year round uh, and, it, and it doesn't rain in your community, uh, if so, please let me know. <laughs> uh, uh, basically, you know, cyclists are going to need a place to store clothing, uh, typically locker uh, facilities. Uh, they need a place to securely uh, store their bicycle. Uh, they would prefer to have facilities that they can store them out of the elements. Uh, these all become extremely important for commuters that are looking at, at more than just uh, recreational rides uh, uh, as they're commuting. And so uh, in this case, a lot of these communities uh, encourage as part of their demand management programs for companies to construct and build these types of facilities uh, at the places of employment. Uh, but smaller employers may not be able to do that. And so these uh, public facilities uh, help service uh, those uh, smaller startup and small businesses uh, that would like to see some of their uh, uh, employees commute by bicycle but may not be able to have those facilities themselves. Okay. Um, next we want to talk a little bit about bike, bike sharing programs. And this is, this is something that, uh, that's really coming online pretty fast in the last two years. Uh, many times these are community-wide programs that allow people that um, even if they're visiting the community to have access to a bike or if you're residents as well. Um, Paris, they've done these in, in Europe, in Denver, Canada. Uh, Washington has a great pilot project that's, that's going on right now. Um, and the, um, um, these, many of these also started first with corporate or limited programs. And uh, human and a corporation in Louisville, which is uh, which is a health insurer, um, has has really done it for their own resident, done it for their own employees. They had a bike share program right out in their front door. It was very visible. It was very much of a, a way to show the public how they value um, getting their employees on bikes. It was so um, popular they had to open it up to the public, and now they have a public bike share in Louisville that's being um, that is being spearheaded by Humana. Tucson, the one on the left. Is actually just a very small um, bike share where they had the the city bought a bunch of bikes. They kept them in their in their facilities garage and they rented them out with a sign out sheet. It can be as simple as that, or it can be as complicated as um, or or as um, 
maybe organized as a, uh, a, a as a pre-designed kind of a, almost like a bike vending system. But whatever works for you, um, it, it, you can do it on any number of scales. It's very scalable. Yeah, Paris's program is now a full bike vending system where you can uh, drop the bikes off at any of these facilities. They're equipped with GPS, so the, the company that manages them can go around and uh, locate these bikes as they move throughout the community. And, th and this shows you some of these bike vending systems um, that are, that are very, becoming very popular, and they're very proven. Um, these, this was experimental as, as, as recent as five years ago, and um, it's really proving itself to be a very effective way for communities to, to, um, to use these systems and, and make them very viable. And they're, they're also a tourism tool that um, if you have conventions coming to town, people can, can use these bikes and, and can get around town. So another um, thing that's, that's coming up in reviding, re around comprehensive bike planning is the new National Bike Route Network. Um, this is something that is, is being developed um, and is something that's kind of ongoing now. I believe that AASHTO has, has adopted this network plan and they're in, in, the, in the throes now of implementing some of the priority routes. Uh, this is very exciting for people, for touring cyclists um, and, if, and, and also for communities that are on these routes to accommodate these cyclists as they come through their communities. Um, this is going to be a, it's a long-term vision um, and it is one that is ongoing right now in terms of very detailed route selection. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's great and if you can get online and look at that map, um, it's something that is, if, you're, if, it's on, if your community is on that route, take advantage of that. Um, Certainly now we want to talk about comprehensive bike planning within communities. Uh, many times the, these are integrated into local comprehensive plans and transportation plans. Um, sometimes they're started by the Department of Public Works as almost a capital improvements plan for bikes and then integrated later on. Every community has to kind of figure out where they are um, and what works best for them. Um, and uh, the, the main thing that, that, that we have seen is uh, that Having political buy-in from from the top down politically is very important. It's difficult for bike advocates to do a bike plan. You really need the support of the mayor, of your political um, um, and your planning kind of infrastructure, your MPOs. Everyone really needs to be on board with that. And um, there are many many strategies to make that work. And um, and everyone kind of has to figure that out as they go forward. But Certainly one way that's worked in is statewide bike route plans. Many states have done this, and a lot of this has been uh, kind of started through tourism. These bike route plans are, are very popular for touring cyclists that will go to a state, they get a hold of these, and, um, and they spend weeks touring through, through states. These also become very important even for regional cycling, for people that want to go um, in-state um, from destination to destination. And um, if your state doesn't have one of these yet, um, I think most states are going, are, are going to, and uh, there's starting to be a demand for states that don't have this to, to start doing it. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about the planning and how, how the um, League of American Bicyclists uh, five E's start to really get into our planning efforts. Um, they have the, um, the League has a very organized bicycle friendly community designation program and you can use those five E's to leverage your planning efforts especially if you get your mayor on board and this is a picture of Mayor Ballard in Indianapolis that has um, within the, the last two years become a bronze designated bicycle friendly community and that really made all the difference to our mayor to understand the importance of bike planning. Um, Indianapolis had done a bike plan in the past and was, was doing many things, but once we knew and the mayor knew that they could get a national designation as a bicycle friendly community, they could get this plaque, they could get some press for it, um, that he became much more interested in it. He hopped right in the he right on it. <laughs> and, and now we're competing with other Midwest cities like Columbus, we're competing um, with other, uh, other Indiana communities, and that competition is, uh, is really what this whole program was about. 
Um, so it, it works very well to get kind of the political leadership on board with bike planning. Uh, not, not only did he focus on, on the, the big E of engineering, uh, which is what we're doing today, but the ed education encouragement and enforcement was also very important. He hosts an annual mayor's bike ride uh, every year uh, that uh, uh, highlights uh, a new facility that has opened in the community and is, is led by the mayor. It's only uh, uh, about 10 miles long, so it's targeted towards your casual cyclists. Uh, the, the, uh, he uh, started training uh, metropolitan police officers to start issuing citations to bicyclists as well as uh, to motorists uh, who violated uh, uh, the bicycles uh, space as, as well as bicyclists who violated the law. But that uh, was first started uh, with an education program uh, so both motorists and bicyclists better understood the traffic laws uh, before they, they moved towards the enforcement mechanism. So these are all things that the city is doing in terms of the other E's, which are just as important policy aspects of the bicycle planning as, as the engineering and facilities. And it's important to know that you know, Indianapolis is, it was like many American communities where car, it's been car dominated for many years, but it started through this planning effort and these maps start to show kind of a, um, really a capital improvements plans for bikes that really started to kind of set the stage for all this. Um, the first two years, um, you start to see some, some major kind of spines of on-street bike facilities that are going. Um, the next uh, two years, you start to see it expand to some, some maybe east-west routes. The downtown is right in the middle of this map, um, so we're starting to get more um, kind of uh, east-west routes um, other than the spokes, and you start to see the next ten, five years, more of those. And um, the next, as we go forward to a build-out, um, then you start to see um, more north-south routes outside of kind of the downtown spoke areas. Um, and you start to see a grid develop um, of bicycle facilities, just like you have a grid for vehicular facilities. And, um, and many communities across America are starting to do this kind of planning. Um, where we are presently? Right here. Um, so you can see that we haven't got uh, to where we want to yet in the next 10 years, but certainly this was part of our initial planning efforts um, that really was spurred on by, by getting the bike-friendly designation and, um, and really started pushing all this through. So certainly if Indianapolis can do it, many communities can do it. Um, some of the funding mechanisms um, that, that we have looked at, certainly capital improvements funding for transportation, your regular transportation dollars, uh, we're seeing now funneled more to include bicyclists, where in the past that wasn't necessarily so. Also, the idea of using environmental funding um, funding for, um, for sewer improvements and those kind of things. If a bike facility can be associated with that, if they're going to be tearing up the pavement um, for environmental work um, and for, our, for our, com our, our combined sewer overflow project, which is a, a billion dollar public works project, um, bicycle, bicycle facilities are going to be incorporated into that as well. Certainly enhancements, transportation enhancement funds have been used. Uh, Department of Energy money, um, uh, air quality funds, um, and other funds. We've been using all of those as packages of money to make this work. Then we want to talk a little more about how we've looked at integrating some of these facilities into an urban setting. And we're going to move a little to uh, Speedway, Indiana, which is a, an excluded community that is completely surrounded by Indianapolis, but it's just uh, west of downtown and includes uh, the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, which is, a, which is a little track that we have here in Indiana that they race a few cars around uh, every year. Uh, it's getting a little busy there about uh, this time of this time of year right now. Uh, basically, the, the front door entrance uh, to this area, though, that has in international visitors coming in from, from all around the world, uh, uh, really was kind of a 450-acre area of uh, old industrial and, and uh, blighted land. And so the, the town of Speedway really looked at creating a complete streets approach uh, to their redevelopment, which focus uh, on pedestrian and bicycle uh, transit within the area to link uh, their retail main street uh, with a lot of the new industry and commercial that they wanted to attract. So uh, this is the uh, Indianapolis uh, Motor Speedway here to the north, and this is the redevelopment area uh, as it stands right now. Uh, this is uh, the old uh, historic downtown main street, uh, which basically uh, was a uh, large museum 
uh, uh, for a good period of, of its existence and is uh, now just starting to uh, see a resurgence. And uh, really the plan uh, looked at taking some uh, major ar arterials and collectors and uh, really retrofitting them uh, with better pedestrian and uh, bicycle facilities as well as uh, connecting into the regional uh, uh, rail trail network, uh, as Pete mentioned, as uh, serving almost as trunk lines or, or the backbone of a more integrated uh, system. So as you can see here, here's part of the pedestrian plan that was uh, developed as, uh, as part of the overall uh, redevelopment plan for the area that really included connecting pathways, uh, sidewalks, and, and bicycle lanes. Uh, included uh, tying in Main Street with uh, with the regional ar arterials, and uh, really creating that complete streets approach, which had uh, integrated bicycle facilities, pedestrian facilities, uh, all within a, a, a downtown area. This is uh, Main Street as as uh, had existed at the beginning of the planning process. Uh, this was uh, basically a uh, civilian drag strip uh, right next to the track. That's uh, Allison Automotive uh, there to, to the south and their manufacturing facility. And uh, basically uh, speeds would reach uh, 50, 60 miles an hour along here uh, with almost 18-foot uh, lanes and, and uh, the parking space. Uh, so there really was, uh, I saw this as a great opportunity to work with in terms of uh, really retrofitting a, a road diet plan and having the opportunities within the right-of-way uh, to put in uh, great bicycle and pedestrian facilities. And uh, so really this is uh, some of the enhancements we wanted to look at in terms of uh, traffic calming, uh, to slow traffic down, uh, more on-street parking, uh, the, the use of uh, bump outs, uh, uh, raised intersections, uh, but then also really integrating the bicycle facilities. And uh, we looked at uh, uh, on-street bicycle lanes, we looked at sharrows, and uh, we looked at uh, cycle track facilities and the advantages and disadvantages of both. Uh, this is the typical section that we uh, finally came up with, uh, in which case we were able to reduce the travel lanes, maintain a lot of the on-street parking, uh, increase the amount of uh, space for pedestrian activity on the sidewalks, uh, uh, low impact development principles as well as uh, being able to put in a uh, full contraflow uh, cycle track. And now, uh, I, as you heard me mention before, there's advantages and disadvantages of cycle tracks and whether or not that was the best approach in this situation. And I'll kind of go into some of the, the reasoning in this case study as, as to why we chose that and what are some of the other facilities that we did look at. So some of the alternatives uh, that we looked at, first of all, was the use of uh, Sharrows uh, and more of a shared road facility. But we felt with, uh, we were hoping to increase the amount of traffic to about 16,000 uh, uh, cars uh, daily. And uh, uh, that uh, really started to uh, create a problem in terms of on-street facilities, although uh, it would have still functioned uh, rather well. Uh, but we uh, really had to stick with uh, angled parking uh, on the street to be able to maximize the amount of on-street parking. We just had to look at the fact that Indianapolis is a very car-dominated environment. We have a very low uh, mobile shift here, and uh, at least in the short term, allowing enough parking for the kind of build-out of residential and mixed use uh, that we wanted to see around here was going to be very important to maximize that on-street parking. Uh, that Because of the angle parking, that creates a very difficult scenario in terms of cars backing out and uh, creating a, a very hostile atmosphere uh, for cyclists uh, uh, on the roadway, uh, especially for your recreational riders that uh, are much more timid in uh, dealing with automobiles. So uh, we also then looked at uh, bicycle lanes, uh, but again, uh, part of what we wanted to do was really uh, reduce the amount of pavement and increase the amount of uh, sidewalk and space to create that, that lively pedestrian life and outdoor dining atmosphere. And uh, you know, some of the advantages, though, of looking at the bicycle lanes was uh, we can get the parking directly up against the sidewalk. Uh, we can reduce conflict between pedestrians and bicycles because the, uh, the, the uh, bicycles were in the roadway and not near the sidewalk. Uh, but really, again, it was a safety concern with the angle parking, and we really would have needed to create much more buffer space than this picture shows uh, between the angled parking uh, and uh, the uh, bicycle lane to allow the distance for the cyclist to react to a car that may be backing out, that the cyclist will be in that car's blind spot. 
The reverse angle parking, we're use, uh, as you see here, was an option we considered, but considering we wanted people to be able to dine out on the street having uh, tailpipes uh, uh, as the first thing that they interact with on the sidewalk, and uh, considering the startup of the automobile creates the most fumes, uh, uh, we, we really couldn't sell that to the town as a, as a viable alternative. Um, and also was going to, with the buffer space we needed, you increase the overall pavement lane width, which is exactly what we wanted to do. Uh, the, the opposite of is to slow down that traffic and uh, have more of that right away de devoted to the sidewalk. Uh, so uh, really, uh, the bicycle lanes uh, created a problem with, uh, with the angle parking in this type of situation. Now, uh, Indianapolis in their downtown area is doing a combination of a sidewalk and cycle facility called the Cultural Trail. And uh, uh, basically, uh, uh, the advantage of uh, looking at uh, a cycle track that would be at grade uh, with the sidewalk is that you know, you're shortening your pedestrian distance uh, for crossing the street. Uh, basically, uh, as people park, they're used to stepping right up on a curb onto a sidewalk area, and uh, it would be able to accommodate the angled parking. But the, the, the same uh, problems that we would have is we'd still have conflicts with automobiles, uh, especially on the side streets. And uh, we actually would see an increase in pedestrian and bicycle conflicts uh, these types of facilities, which are used uh, much more extensively in Germany, uh, you see a, a, a threefold increase in conflicts with, with uh, cyclists and uh, pedestrians because often pedestrians will not differentiate uh, where they should be walking versus where the cyclist should be riding. Uh, so, and uh, basically, you have to think your cyclist is going three to four times faster than your pedestrian, so these accidents can actually be fairly severe. Uh, and uh, with people getting out of their cars and then having to traverse a bicycle lane and not knowing it because it's at the same grade as the sidewalk, uh, we felt that that would be very much a, a concern. So we really looked at having a, a cycle track or a side path that would be at the same grade as the roadway. Uh, so that way, as, as your parkers got out of their cars, they would still have to step down into what uh, really looked like a roadway again. So they would uh, kind of hopefully automatically look both ways uh, before uh, crossing uh, back onto the sidewalk. Uh, the, the, the basic drawbacks to this is uh, it's, it's that additional crossing area. And, uh, and we would still have uh, intersection conflicts uh, where you may have uh, streets uh, that would be intersecting. And uh, one advantage to the design that we have is, is uh, we eliminated a lot of curb cuts and some of the cross streets uh, onto Main Street coming from the east. Uh, so it actually made it uh, much more suitable for the use of a cycle track or a side path uh, and eliminated one of the main concerns with, the, uh, with automobiles approaching uh, from those side streets and not being able to see the cyclists and are not looking for the cyclists uh, on the side path. So as you can see the uh, design then at the, at the intersection uh, crossings here, you would have your raised intersections. Uh, the cycle track, it would be a two-way cycle track uh, that would be running between the sidewalk uh, and the parking area at the same grade uh, as, uh, the, uh, uh, as the street. Uh, so you do have uh, some pedestrian, potential pedestrian conflict points, uh, but we feel that because of how they're designed, they look like you're crossing a street again. Uh, we also used uh, colored pavement uh, where you are uh, actually crossing uh, the, uh, the side street here uh, to really make that cycle track pop uh, with the bicycle signal so they know that they're going to be having to look for bicycles at the same time that they're going to be scanning for automobiles. And in you know, Portland, uh, you see uh, uh, drivers adapt uh, to crossing bicycle lanes in the pavement all the time now. So, I mean, these are things that drivers can learn over time as they become more familiar with these types of uh, facilities. Uh, obviously, making sure from a travel demand standpoint that you have the parking available when you're trying to encourage these facilities. So that included the installation of bike racks, including uh, new changes to zoning uh, that uh, required uh, bicycle parking that was to be just as convenient as any off-street parking. Uh, that would be available to the businesses. 
Uh, we also looked at trying to be innovative with the stop controls, knowing that bicyclists often did rolling stops uh, where, where they didn't want to stop, uh, just because of the sheer amount of uh, calories and effort it takes uh, uh, compared to what we would not notice uh, for an automobile. And so uh, we're actually requiring stops uh, for traffic uh, on Main Street as well as the side streets, uh, but actually uh, installing yields uh, for the bicycle path. So they would be required to yield to oncoming traffic, uh, but they would not be statutorily required uh, to make a full and complete stop if they uh, do not have to. Uh, so that's a little experimental, and so we're trying that out to, uh, to, to see how that works. Uh, but, you know, again, really we're being realistic to how uh, the various modes of transportation actually operate. So uh, the great thing is where are we now? Uh, that, that construction actually started on that uh, two years ago. Uh, the design uh, very much fell in line with uh, where we wanted the planning to be. Uh, they're currently finishing uh, construction as we speak uh, to, to be done in time for the race. Uh, so you can see here on the left is uh, some of the actual uh, path that's installed that has not been uh, striped or, uh, or colored yet. Uh, and uh, we just uh, had the groundbreaking uh, last week, so it's going to be really interesting to see uh, as this area builds up uh, how this is going to be operated, especially as it ties into the, uh, the larger uh, uh, bicycle network. Uh, so with that, uh, we're going to uh, go ahead and, uh, and uh, stop and uh, turn it back over uh, uh, for uh, questions at this point in time. Uh, if you have any uh, questions, for us after the session that you weren't able to get in during the question and answer period, uh, we would be uh, uh, more than happy for you to uh, contact. Uh, this is, uh, here's our contact information here. Okay, great. We've received a large number of questions. We won't be able to get through all of them, but we'll try to get through as many of them as we can. So Matthew wanted to know, are there any common standards for the amount of bike parking required per square foot of commercial uses? Yeah, that, that's a good question. And the way I, we've been seeing that work lately in, in communities, at least in, uh, in Indiana, is they'd make it a percentage of their car parking, which I think is an interesting idea to tie it to the volume of car parking. That's one way, um, and that way you don't, you don't necessarily have to, uh, have to go through the calculation uh, that you would necessarily for the building. But Shane, Mike, what do you yeah. have? And, and I mean, I, I think you need to, to really customize that for your community and look at what your actual modal split is, keeping in mind that as you increase those number of facilities, there's that latent demand out there that you will see people, as those facilities get built, they will start using those facilities. Uh, for example, the demographic of a typical uh, bike trail is the demographic of the neighborhood that it goes through. It's not your uh, Lycra road warriors. Uh, per se, as, as you often think, it's going to be the people that, that surround that area, and, and we're expecting that in Speedway as well. Uh, so you really kind of want to use common sense as you're developing those standards to, to not be uh, uh, too intrusive to the businesses, but at the same time uh, allow for some growth. And make sure the parking is where people will use it. Don't put it back by the dumpster and for, for bikes. That's right. People have expensive bikes, and they want to be able to see them if they can. Okay, great. The next question, well, we had a series of questions around bike helmets, so I'm just going to pick one of them. Kenneth wanted to know, uh, he said, you mentioned that the Netherlands bike riders do not wear helmets, which was clearly shown in the images. Do you think that wearing the, of helmets in the U.S. actually leads to less likelihood of bicycling? After all, it is one more thing to wear, bring, along with the bike locks. And unlike other forms of transit, car, train, bus, only bike riders are compelled to wa uh, wear helmets. Okay, yeah, this is Pete. I, I want to kind of start with this about about maybe what it's very. This is a very kind of divisive issue in the bicycle community, or it can be. Um, but I, you know, I'm going with uh, Bicycle Indiana, which is our statewide bike advocacy group. You know, their um, which I'm involved in, and their policy is is that that they promote helmet use in in in, in organized bike rides and commuting. You know, they promote um, helmet use as a safe a means of cycling. Now it's not a law in Indiana, so we're not saying that everyone has to do it. Some states have laws, um, and in that case, certainly it's a law. Either you have to do it, um, but you know, I think I think taking the good middle ground that it's a good best practice, especially right now in in America, um, uh, where we're not really the the our bikes, our level of safety is not at Amsterdam yet. 
Well, and I think you're also seeing a generational shift uh, with sports as, uh, as extreme sports are becoming more of the norm with younger generations. Uh, helmet use has, has been increasing. Uh, younger generations, the, the, the threshold of helmet use is much higher. They're much more stylish than those wonderful helmets back in the 80s. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm also a skier. Uh, it's, it's amazing that helmet use in skiing has now surpassed the 50% threshold, uh, and that's just been a change over the past couple of years, uh, and it's, it's highest amongst the younger generation, about uh, 80% now. Uh, so, uh, uh, you know, the, those are things that I think you're going to continue to just see a, a natural shift on. The next question, this one is probably a quick one. Where can we get yep. data about women on bikes that have, uh, that you mentioned? That's a question from Holloway. Hmm. Um, that's, that's a good question. I know that the article I was referring to is in Scientific American. Um, you might be able to do a good, a good uh, do a Google search um, for that uh, on Scientific American. It was, a, it was a very well researched article and that data may be in there. Off the top of my head, um, I am not sure if there's uh, any, there's, there's, I don't think there's census data around that um, that I'm aware of, but they, that article may have some information, yeah. Okay, great. How can we expect to see biking succeed in the U.S. on the same scale and with the same pace as countries like Denmark and the Netherlands where so many Americans, uh, American urban areas have developed and planned to lack functional density? So that's a question from Chase. So how do we deal with this issue of density in developing bike infrastructure? Well, and, and let me just mention one, you know, in, in comparing Europe to America, it's kind of problematic, but I think one thing that could be consistent is they've just had a, a, a they've had a head start on us. They've been doing this a lot longer than we have, and I think they're at a different place than we are just because they've started sooner. Um, so I would say that um, that that we can be at that level to a large extent given time and given commitment. Now the density issue, you know, is, is maybe another issue. That's a good question. But for the most part, though, you, you know, even. Even, for example, uh, Indianapolis, which is extremely spread out, uh, as it was a completely automobile-dominated city from the beginning, uh, you know, it still has a functional density for, for bike riding to where you can make convenience trips in a relatively short, short period of time. I mean, the one great thing about the bicycles is they have access to both uh, the, the network you build for them as well as the road network uh, or the sidewalk network, depending upon your community. Uh, uh, so, so some of that infrastructure is already in place, and uh, just like a bus, uh, it doesn't have to be fixed route. Uh, so, so you have a, a, a it, it has a head start on public transit now. Right? Yep. All right. Are there rules and standards which allow people with physical limitations that are somewhat able to bicycle but with electronic, electric pedal assisted mechanisms to use the designated bike lanes or paths? That's a question from Richard. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. The, the, the electric pedal cycles are, from what I understand, is they are still seen as bicycles as long as they have functional pedals. And many, many of the new products of the electric bikes do not, if you stop pedaling them occasionally, they will power down their electric cells. So I think that's the definition of a pedal cycle that, that many of these manufacturers have gone by. And I believe that as long, that's a good question. Each, each community has to define that for themselves. But as a cyclist, I see, you know, and I, I passed a guy on, a, on an electric pedal cycle. I think it was a giant. They make a pretty, a pretty neat bike like that. And, you know, he was cruising along about 18 miles an hour, and he was, he was only pedaling occasionally, and it kind of freaked me out because I didn't know why he was going faster than me. But the idea is it still functioned as a bicycle. You know, I mean, he was still, he had to pedal occasionally once he, he once it powered down to, to power back up, so he was keeping up a pace. I don't know, to me that seemed to function somewhat like a bike, even though he was going a little bit faster maybe than normal. So I, that would be my observation. Yeah, I, would, I would almost define it as a function of, of speed. Yeah. Because uh, even yeah. some mopeds with governors on are, are, are going to interact very well with bicycles. Uh, it, I think it's once you pass that, that threshold of, of one mode of transportation going significantly faster than another right. is when that conflict will occur. Right. Okay, great. I think we have time for one more question. All right. Um, 
Okay, this one's from Steve. For your T intersection design, the side street is stop controlled but placed way back behind the crosswalk and uh, cycle track. With the curb extensions as well, the uh, side street drivers will need to cheat out qu uh, quite a ways to enter the roadway, making a left or a right turn. Is there concern with drivers constantly blocking the cycle track and sidewalk? Yeah, that's always that that's that's always a concern when you have a side path or a cycle track that is going to be interacting uh, at at one of those uh, uh, types of intersections. Uh, one way to handle that, if you have enough right of way, is is to uh, jug handle that cycle track uh, so it uh, it crosses it immediately up at the same place that the pedestrians will cross, and you're going to actually. Uh, intermix your pedestrian and then bicycle traffic again. Uh, that that will allow for enough room for the the, the automobile to uh, decelerate uh, to the stop, and uh, it's going to decrease the amount of uh, of the ability for the the automobile to creep up. But that's that's a problem you have in crosswalks as well. I mean, you're you're not going to totally be able to eliminate that. I can't, I can't tell you how many vehicles I've never seen stop at a stop. Right. <laughs> okay, I think we have time to sneak in one last question. So this question is about regular street cleaning. Deborah asks, sediment road debris kicked to curb in the bike lane makes it hazardous for bicyclists. Too often communities do retrofit or design for new lanes, but there's no consideration for regular road cleaning. Any suggestions? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, yeah, I'm a community. I, the, the bike lanes I commute in are, are filled with aggregate this time of year because um, they, the uh, yeah the um, you know the the roads throw the aggregate in the bike lane and the roads stay fairly clear from the from the cars. But yeah, I think you have to have a sweeping program of some type, and that needs to be part of your management of your whole bike system. Um, each community has to figure that out how that works. But you're right, it has to be done. Um, otherwise, you're going to limit your you know some people aren't going to feel comfortable riding, especially with very skinny tire bikes in that bike lane. Yep. That's okay. a big issue. Great. Well, thank you all very much for joining us. For those of you, I'm sorry we didn't get to all the questions, but if you'd still like to ask the question, you can feel free to email Pete or Shane, and they can follow up with you. Just as a reminder, as you log out today, you're going to be asked to fill out a survey about today's session. We hope you enjoyed it, and we always appreciate your feedback. Thank you very much for joining us. For Pete and Shane, I will be uh, signing us off, and then I'll follow up with you by email with a copy of the evaluation from today's event. Again, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.